What's up, cash flow contractors? Khalil here, and lots and lots of exciting things going on here at the Cash Flow Contractor. It's our 200th episode. We've done it. We've crossed that barrier that we've looked at for months, saying, wow, we're going to get to 200 episodes. <laughs> but we're finally here, and we've got a special guest today, Michael Girdley, one of my favorite business thought leaders that is out there. Essentially, I've followed him for probably three, four years on Twitter. And at one point, six, seven months ago, he posted, hey, if you run a podcast and need a guest, send your show and I'll ask to be on if I like it. And he wanted to help a smaller show like ours grow and have a great influencer on there. And so that's where we are today. We've got Michael Girdley joining us and it was such a fun conversation. Look up to him so much. Essentially what we did is I took some of my favorite Twitter threads that he's written over the years and I just asked him to elaborate on them and to give more context and flesh them out a little bit for our audience. So it's a really great conversation with so much information. In the show notes, we link to everything from Michael Girdley, from the companies that he helps run to the companies that he's an advisor with. It's just a really great conversation. Thanks for tuning in for our tune of the episode. We hope you enjoy. This idea of the genius with a thousand helpers or genius with 12 helpers, a lot of businesses run that way. And if you want to sell your business someday, you need to figure out how to run your business as a real business. I'd rather be in a great business with a mediocre team than a mediocre business with a great team. The market wins every time. Less stress, more time, more money. Welcome to the Cash Flow Contractor interview. Martin, we were talking a little bit about how much we love San Antonio. I've spent quite a bit of time down there with family and stuff like that. But uh, one of the, I've always said it would be miserable to live there. Our guest doesn't think so, I don't think. What's your experience with San Antonio? Who, me or well, Martin? Martin, Martin. I'm going to Martin, <laughs> I think, I mean, I think it's great. opinion first. I, yeah. Go ahead, Martin. <laughs> I, I, I Absolutely love San Antonio. It's a little like being in Colorado, but warmer. And if you're not there in July down on the river walk or something, you know, in the, standing in the blazing sun, it's, it's awesome. It's a bilingual community, which yeah. is kind of fun. I mean, a cultural mix that's down there. And then when you get west of town, there's just unbelievably gorgeous hill country. Yeah. So it's is, been great. Is, uh, is Wemba Miana going to bring the dynasty back, Michael? I don't know. The team is really bad. Really <laughs> bad. <laughs> I, have, I have a partial season ticket package and all at once you mm. want to go because there's two or three players on the team that are really good and fun to watch. And then, you know, usually at least several times they pass the ball to their coach, like not intentionally. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's like, and Popovich is, you know, being delightful about, uh, you know, going through that with these young guys. But and I mean, I think what's going great with the Spurs right now is their offense is coming together. They're getting to where they can score finally. You know, we only won three games before the new year, uh, but the defense is still like Ole. Ole. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. Yeah. It's like yeah. have you guys considered putting your hands up? It would really help. And uh, but <laughs> uh, I have a season ticket package or a partial one, and I love going just because there's so much energy in the room now, and that's. Even though the team is even worse than last year, having Wimbayama here has been galvanizing for the community. Like that, yeah. it's a scene again at the at the arena, and I think that's just great for for San Antonio. That's our only professional sports team, so we're grateful for it. Yeah. And it's good to see him thrive. Well, huge for the culture down there for so many years, like almost two decades. Um, but I I was able to go to a couple of games. My father owned a convenience store called Superior Food Mart in San Antonio. And my uncle still lives there and owns a couple of gas stations. But uh, I got to go see when David Robinson and Tim Duncan were on the team. I watched them play wow. Paul Pierce in the Celtics with Antoine Walker and a couple other guys. And then the next game was Shaq and Kobe with the Lakers. Yeah. So two all-time games. But that was, oh, man, great San Antonio teams. Um, so awesome. Well, uh, for listeners that don't know Michael, huge um, fan of Michael here. Uh, follow you on Twitter. I've been following you for a couple of years and um, really appreciate all that you do to educate and share content. So you're building your empire of businesses. You talk a lot about holding companies and um, evaluating businesses. You have your own podcast, Acquisitions Anonymous, um, where you help people that are addicted to acquiring businesses go through 12 steps. 
No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but you, 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 it's a really fun show to listen to. I will, we'll link to in the show notes and talk about it in a little bit as well. But, um, I want to talk about building your construction empire. If Michael Girdley was to go and focus not on software, not on coffee shops, not on fireworks, not on any of those things, but focus on construction, how would that happen? So we're going to go through a, a little bit of a, a script here in terms of the different phases of it. But let's say that you're construction company owner, you're doing well, you've got things figured out, but you're ready to go into the empire mode. How can you grow your team, get out of the business, acquire other companies, build a holding company, et cetera, et cetera. So let's start with the growing your team. I love what you talk about with core behaviors versus core values. Let's let's dive into it. What is the dip what is, why do values matter, first of all, but then what is the difference between core values and core behaviors? Yeah. Well I think everybody goes through and does this kind of same um, BS level core values exercise and they put them up on the wall and they say, we're going to have high integrity and we're going to have honest and we're going to be in customer centric and all this kind of stuff. And you look at what happens with those classic core values that are on the wall. Uh, everybody just walks past them. Like they get mentioned every once in a while, but they don't actually ever get used as a tool to shape your culture. And what people, I think, including myself, have realized over the past couple of decades is it's not about what words you put on the wall or what brand is on your T-shirt or, you know, do you have pizza parties in terms of defining a culture? It's what sort of behaviors are you promoting inside of your organization, right? And like, how do you train and align everybody around how to do that? And, and when your company is small, that's easy to do. Because everybody learns your culture and what you want as a CEO or as a founder of your business or of your contracting company, they learn that by watching what you do. They're in meetings with you and they have that time. And it's part of one of the powers of being in office. Um, over time, as your company gets bigger, you don't get to do that anymore as a, as a CEO owner. Or if you're running a contracting company and you have some people in the office and some people out in the field, like, you know, those people who are out in the field don't necessarily get to see you all the time and understand kind of what that is. So... Core behaviors is really this idea that instead of defining four or five or six core values, integrity, customer centric, honesty, whatever, um, instead of doing it that way and relying upon those to shape your culture, what you really need to do is define core behaviors of what sort of activities you want your company to be doing. So, you know, I learned about this process um, from a book and also from my friend who runs a staffing company here in San Antonio, uh, VIP staffing. And uh, he's used this system to a great extent. I've used it inside of my org to shape the culture. And so like one of the ones he has is uh, we return all phone calls the same day, right? If we get a phone call that day. And so like, you're like, that doesn't sound like much of a core value, but it's a core behavior that he has instilled inside of his organization that is transformative because not now we don't say, hey, we're customer centric or we don't say we're responsive. We say, oh, hey, like we return calls yeah. and this is how we live that core value. So they're tied together, but ultimately you get so much more specific. So there's a recipe and an opportunity for your team to follow that and all be aligned around that. And so this core behavior system um, of which you end up with like 20 or so of these core behaviors can be transformative in an organization rather than just five nebulous kind of core values. That is what most people do. Yeah. I mean, and it gets objective really more than subjective, right? And uh, makes it really clear for people to understand. Um, so I want to talk about what, a little bit of the hiring process and what you should be looking for in an A player and why an A player matters. When you have, you know, you've hired thousands of people, um, what are, and maybe it's not directly you, obviously, but when you are hiring, why does an A player matter and what do you define an A player as? Yeah. So hiring just as a meta comment is one of those things that everybody thinks they're a scientist about, but nobody actually is. Like there's just <laughs> so much bull crap out there in yeah. terms of the way people think about hiring. Like, I mean, I'm sure you've heard this like, oh, here's what I do. I, I, I have hidden cameras in my reception area to see what my, see what the candidates, how they treat my receptionist, right? Or I drop a hundred dollar bill on the floor and you see this kind of just misconception about how people work and how the world works in the idea that you can find these magic beans, right? These magic questions that you can deploy down and ask somebody this magic, what's your favorite interview question? And it's like, no, those tricks do not work. <laughs> like they've been proven <laughs> not to work. And you've seen it in the history of things like Microsoft and Google. Like, I don't know, 
if if you guys were around for this kind of stuff, but in the late nineties, there was this whole idea of like, they would ask you like these puzzle questions, like how many yeah. ping pong balls can fit inside of a 747? You're supposed to figure out like, or oh, how many window washers there are in New York. It's like, well, a, a real uh, famous one was why are manhole covers round? Yes. Uh, did you, it's a fun answer, but it doesn't tell you anything yeah. if I'm going to be a good employee yeah. or not. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, it's to save metal. No, I'm just kidding. It's because you yeah. don't want the manhole cover to fall yeah. on the first down. It, there's no way it can fall through the hole. Never mind. That's a distraction. No, no. I'm, but, yeah, I remember that. But it's a great point that it's just like, stop trying to find these like tricks, right? And it's, it's yeah. a problem with America. We all want to take a pill when we actually need to do some real work. And the real work you have to do is uh, you have to understand how people work. There's a normal distribution of people, right? We have the normal curve that we know. And the top 10% of people are going to produce a heck of a lot more than the middle 50%. And your job is to figure out how to find those people that for a given job in a given role and a given pay band are going to produce more than the next person. And so that's my definition of an A player. It is very different than what you hear a lot of people use, like the Steve Jobs, like asshole genius mm -hmm. um, type definition. That is not my definition of A player. My A player is if I'm going to hire a housekeeper or a chef or a CEO, like I want to hire the person for that given role, that given set of responsibilities is going to be a top 10% performer. So that's how I define A players. And then I'll pause there, but we can go into how to find them. I want to throw one thing out. Uh, I think there's a thing, everybody knows the 80-20 rule that 20% yep. give you 80 of the benefit, 20% yep. give you, but Jordan Peterson describes a uh, Price's Law which is more accurate. And it's this, it says the square root of the people engaged in a project do half the work. Okay. So if you have nine people, that means three are doing half, no big deal. If you have a thousand, what's the square root of a thousand? I don't know. Point? You lost me there, Martin. I can't do it. Anyway, a very small fraction are doing half the work. And those are the A players. And it's so much more powerful to get those people in place, even though they're, the drawbacks oftentimes are they're expensive. And so yeah. anyway, that's just comes to mind as we think about why it's so important. hundred percent. Yeah. So when, when you're doing those, the, you're looking for that 10% player, what are some like even generic across the board, not specific to the role, but specific to more of the values and the talent level, um, the behaviors that they default to that you look for in an A player? Yeah. So, you know, I'm a big believer in defining a set system that everybody in the organization can run. Um, and so I actually, based on a number of things that have been proven scientifically to work in studies about how hiring works, I have a whole system uh, that I've talked about on social media. You can download it for free. It's on my Twitter and, and website and stuff. Um, but basically, it's based around the ideas that you know, when scientists have gone and done studies of what could actually predict that somebody's going to be a good employee, there are certain things that are above and beyond more predictive than everything else. It's not trick questions. Mm -hmm. It's not how old you are. It's not where you went to school or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, it is, you know, what was your past behavior like, right? Uh, how well are you able to fit kind of the emotional requirements of an individual job? Um, what did your former colleagues say about you? Uh, in terms of all those things, um, like when you talk to them as references, like those, there's, you know, five of those things that are super important. So what I do now is I have a whole system that I use um, and there's the full blown version of it for senior people. And I scale it down the more junior the person is. And the idea is to go through and spend time with them to understand a number of those kind of factors that I just talked about. For example, uh, when I do reference checking, I do it radically different than everybody else does. Everybody else mm -hmm. generally teach treats reference checking as a, you call up, hey, did Jen's, Jim steal from your company? No? Okay, cool. Thanks. Bye. Did he work there? Great. Bye. You know, like what I will do uh, through an interview process is go first in the interview process, identify people who know the candidate the best, and then go actually sit down after being connected to them by the candidate and have a discussion with their former bosses, colleagues, customers, vendors, and really try to fill out the picture that I've already learned after visiting with the candidate and have real discussions with them. Like, you know, how does how does Jim perform the best? What should I do to help Jim perform the best? Uh, what are some things that you've seen him need help with from management? And notice I'm not trying to like dig out any sort of like dirt on them. I'm actually trying to problem solve through those type of questions. 
how can I help Jim come into my company and thrive? And how do I know Jim the best so I can craft a role that's going to work great for him? And so, you know, that difference and having a process that understands the science of what actually predicts candidate success is just a game changer for me because I can have a much higher chance of hiring somebody that's this top 10% player instead of just hoping they walk in the door, which, you know, a lot of people's hiring processes right now are just rolling dice and hoping they get there. Yeah. I think <clears throat> specifically in construction, it's in small business in general, it's really common to hire people you know, and even more commonly to hire people that are friends. Any advice around that? Any stories that you have of maybe not the best idea? Uh, look, every time I've hired a friend or gone into business or invested in a friend's company, uh, I immediately said to myself, okay, like uh, if this doesn't work out with them, I'm okay with losing all of my money because I'd rather keep the friendship. Um, mm -hmm. Anytime I've hired a friend, like we've had a discussion beforehand, like, look, there's business and there's our friendship and I'm going to be, I'm going to treat you professionally. I'm going to treat you like my friend separately, uh, but I'm going to treat you through respect no matter what. And we should both have a discussion that at some point I may have to fire you or you may fire me and go get a better job. And I am going to be an adult about that and I'm totally fine with it. That sort of maturity and also the willingness to just take the hit if things go awry to save the friendship uh, has helped me a lot. There are horror stories of people hiring friends. Uh, I've done it myself. You have to fire them. You haven't had a good discussion or relationship ahead of time or you've not you know, taken the hit to maintain the friendship. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a reason several of my companies have strict no nepotism policies. We just don't hire friends or family. Yeah. <laughs> it works pretty well. <laughs> no, so good. So good. So um, something that came up recently with hiring, um, I was talking to a roofer and they're having trouble managing the phones and just really need kind of an admin person. And they're really struggling to find people. I think they had like 90 people apply on Indeed and two people show up to interviews and yeah. nobody really wanted, was qualified. And that's a common story in a lot of entry level roles. And um, we've talked about this a little bit with John Matzner on the show. Uh, but just hiring offshore talent. I know that you run Near. You're a co-founder of that, and that's access to talent in Latin America. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. So yep. Latam, uh, in particular, yeah. is where we specialize. Yeah, and so I think, especially in construction, I see the value of Latin America because so many of the employees that you're managing are Latin American, um, and so I see a real uh, opportunity there to hire people that are overseas in admin roles. Uh, to help you manage not only customer uh, correspondence, but also team correspondence. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about what you're seeing with Latin America, what the what the real value and talent is uh, mm -hmm. down there and opportunities that lie ahead for companies? Yeah. Well, I think we started near, uh, and to be clear, I don't run anything. I'm on the board okay. uh, and I help get it started. Uh, this, a lot of times people ask me like, oh, you're in 12 companies. Like, how do you run them all? I was like, okay, here's the secret. <laughs> I don't run any of them. And if I am, I'm, it's a huge mistake. Um, I sit on boards and I support the right CEOs and leaders as they grow personally and the business. So so near, you know, I have two partners that we incubated and started that business with together. Uh, one of whom is Argentinian, the other one is American. They are CEO and COO, I'm board chairman. And then we have a team of 25 or so at this point of people working there. So, you know, we started it because what we started seeing during COVID was it used to be only large businesses would hire globally, right? It was only Price Waterhouse, uh, Exxon Mobil, like all these big corporations. You know, I, I don't, most people are, are don't know that like most of the financial audits and bookkeeping that all BDO and all these big corporations do, uh, or even ExxonMobil, like so much of America's financial data gets shipped to these offices in the Philippines or Indonesia or Argentina. Uh, and what that's done is over the past decades created these workforces that are totally up to speed on American bookkeeping styles, American work styles, all this kind of stuff. So it's not just that um, there are people who are just call centers or Indian programmers anymore. Like there are tons of people who are up to speed on how that works. Um, and so what I saw and what we saw as we incubated the business during COVID was more and more people who are on the small business side uh, starting to see this same opportunity, right? That with the internet, with all the technologies we have now, your hiring pool doesn't have to be just your local town or just North America. It can be global 
uh, in terms of the workforce that's available to you. And, and I've started to build companies exactly the same way. Uh, the last two companies that we launched last year uh, all have at least half international workforces. There's Americans and then there's people overseas. So I'm seeing more and more of my friends, colleagues, uh, people in my CEO peer group, they're all like realizing to be competitive now, you have to hire not just from the pool that's right outside your front door, but, but globally. And so LATAM is actually wonderful. So number one, it's relatively close time zone. And then if you go deal with a lot of the cultures like in Argentina or Venezuela or people in Mexico, they are really much more similar to what we experience here in the United States. Like, like I live in San Antonio, which is 60, 70% Hispanic. It feels like the northernmost city in Mexico a lot of times. Um, so the Mexican <laughs> culture is so close to what we're doing. And I think that presents a great opportunity. I'm seeing just a lot of small businesses now where it just used to only be big businesses, but now small businesses are, are really getting comfortable hiring globally. And it's not just like base level roles, it's senior level stuff, salespeople, yeah. heads of marketing, finance, data analysis. Uh, and it's great. I mean, it's, it's helping my friends who own businesses and then their existing employees succeed and scale themselves. So really good stuff. Yeah. I think it. We have people overseas. Uh, my executive assistants in Ecuador, and it's it's been a real pleasure to work with. And I think the biggest challenge that, or myths, I think that people face in in construction companies is thinking that they're not going to be able to manage them well, that they're not going to be able to handle the remote aspect. And it is a challenge at times. There are definitely hurdles that you've got to jump over. But if you can create systems, I've found that the incentives for those employees are massive compared to an, especially an entry level role, uh, where over here you're making, you know, now it's so much more, so much more expensive. We're getting up to like 16, $17 an hour for an entry level role. Um, whereas if you pay that same amount to someone overseas, they can be very experienced and they're thrilled to be paid that same amount, uh, and going to work much harder for that, for that role than probably someone who doesn't have the experience and is just scraping by in a lot of these, uh, these markets where that's not going to cut it. So, that's my experience. You mentioned hiring one CEOs. Other, Go ahead. But before CEOs, one other thing that I know is a problem for the construction companies I work with, small, is they don't know what they're going to give to these people. Yeah. How to start handing it off. That might be a little much for this conversation, but you know, once you start handing it off and you start realizing, wow, I've got my time back, then you more and more and more. Yeah. If you've got anything to say about that. Absolutely. So I think there's two things. One is like remote work, just like us recording a podcast remotely, like that's a different set of skills we've had to learn. And most managers have gone into remote work or overseas employees not realizing they have to do things differently that and be intentional about things that they used to get for free when they were in the office. Right. For example, mm -hmm. Well, if you hired a brand new employee, a lot of the socialization and culture that we talked about before used to just happen because they would see people around the water cooler or talk, you know, or, or go to lunch together. But when you're fully remote, you have to be intentional to create those things. And so a lot of managers today, and I was one of these, like when I first started to do remote work, my first few remote employees did not work out. And the reason was not their problem. The reason was I sucked as somebody managing a remote employee. So that has to be, I think, first and foremost, that you, when you start to make this transition, not just to overseas people, but to remote in general, you have to start to change how your behavior is and your mindset and be comfortable growing to be a better manager and identify those things you got for free before, and you have to be intentional about them now. So that's point number one. Point number two is I think there is a big gap where people, and it's why we created Near. Uh, hireworknear.com, please go be our customer. We need the money. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, you, you, I recommend people go in with a partner. And when we first started near, actually what we tried to do is do an American style job board that would enable small businesses to go hire offshore folks. And it didn't work. And as we went to go talk mm -hmm. to customers, they were just like, look, we're so confused. Like, we don't even know if I hire a Mexican employee, like, like what taxes do I need to pay? Or like, what, uh, how do I do a background check on them? Like nobody has any clue about that stuff. So I think that's where I recommend people, if you have the opportunity, go to somebody like Nier and there's some competitors to Nier, like hire a partner who can help you through that process. Um, for example, in Argentina, this is one of the things that blew my mind. You know, we do background checks here in the United States, totally with private services. Uh, in Argentina, you go to the, there's a little government office and you go over there and they give you a piece of paper. 
like the government does it. So you don't know that unless you have a partner. And that's why I really recommend having, you know, having that approach, especially when you're starting out, like go find somebody that's a vendor like us and let them shepherd you through the whole thing. Whoa, Good hold shit. on. Shepherd. <laughs> yeah. They're, well, well, they're great too. There? <laughs> they're great too. Yeah. I mean, Nick is awesome and those guys are good. Yeah. So, I mean, the thing about staffing and the thing about what's going on with offshoring, like there's a bazillion firms and ultimately like oh, yeah. it's a services model and find somebody you can trust and you gel with their culture. And if it's near or it's Shepherd or uh, Oceans XYZ or whatever, like there's there's dozens of them out there. Shop around and see who you like. I think we're great, but that's just me. But yeah, Nick, Nick and those guys yeah, are great I... too. Hey there, listeners. Just a moment. I want to take a break from our conversation with Michael to ask you to support our show. We've done 200 episodes. Martin and I have put our heart and soul into this show for the last four and a half years. And we are finally making huge strides. Our audience is growing. We're getting more views across all of our channels. And it's thanks to listeners like you. If you haven't yet, help us in growing this channel. Help us to produce more content and to keep going and to feel encouraged by your support by going and subscribing. Subscribe to our newsletter from our website. You can find the link in the show notes. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow and like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. It really makes a huge difference in helping us to reach more contractors and put out great content like our episode with Michael. And your support helps us to fund this podcast by finding sponsors for our show. So please, if you haven't already, go subscribe. We can't thank you enough for listening. It means the world to us. Back to the show with Michael. Okay, so we're building this empire. We've figured out our culture. We've hired some A players. We've included some offshore talent. Uh, to maximize our output for lower costs. We're doing great. You mentioned that you are not running any companies. You're just on the board and managing CEOs. So I want to talk about what is that first step? What is it like hiring a CEO for the first time in a company and why do you do it? Yeah. So it is, uh, it's super hard. <laughs> so, and it's scary <laughs> and it's risky and difficult. So other than that, it's fantastic. But look, ultimately, and, you know, I built a whole course last year around this idea of hold coing, which to me is, uh, you know, you own a holding company of multiple businesses and you do parallel entrepreneurship. Instead of owning one business and having it grow, you own multiple businesses and you have multiple irons in the fire. Um, and so that's the idea of people that choose to do a hold co. And ultimately, the lens I tell people about it is to think about it like this. 99% of the people should... Uh, get a job. They will be happier having a W-2 and then and working for somebody else. There is nothing wrong with that. Like we need those people. They need to run companies and or they need to work in companies and we need them to, to do that. So that is perfectly good. Some people should do a W-2 lifestyle. And that's your lens. If you want to do that, like great. Thumbs up. Then there is the next of the 1% left, the vast majority of those people, let's say 90% of those people should own one business and be a CEO of that one business. They will be happiest doing that. Like my CEO peer group is 20 people. I am the only one that's in multiple businesses. The rest of the group, they are all happy being owner operators of 10 to $50 million a year businesses that generate them a very nice lifestyle. And they are the in there every day running that business. That is a great lifestyle for other people. There is this third lifestyle and the one that's right for me, which is I want to maximize my impact on the world. I want to coach CEOs every day. I want to do what I do and live this lifestyle. There's a small percentage of people that should be whole co-entrepreneurs and I'm one of them. And so that's the first thing I tell people is don't solve for what you think is going to be sexy on your resume or what your mom thinks you should be doing or some guy at the country club thinks is the right lifestyle for you. Like first and foremost, decide, do you want to just be a great life running a single business and owning it. Uh, and, and the way to decide that is look at what somebody like me does all day and decide if that's fun to you. Like <laughs> I, if, if you like what I'm doing and you want to be in multiple businesses and that seems like a fun lifestyle to you on a day-to-day -day basis, you're going to tap dance to work, like go ahead and do it. But I think that's the very first thing people get wrong about this hold co thing is they do it for the wrong reasons, money or prestige or something good to write about on Twitter. Like those are all wrong. Like first thing to do, very first step is decide what kind of life you want to live. And then we can go build the whole business thing around that to match and maximize the life we want. I, uh, I read somewhere in something, one of your posts that, uh, you stepped out typically when a CM, CRM stepped in, <laughs> customer resource management yeah. software came in, that's time for you to be out. Yeah. I thought that was pretty insightful <laughs> that 
Uh, yeah, that really correlates well with when I stopped being a good CEO. And and the past couple of years, what I've really done was, in, in the coffee business was the first one of these, when I started to incubate companies, I figured that, oh, it was only going to scale if I figured out a way to start businesses uh, and incubate them without ever being the CEO. So my goal at these points is to never be a CEO of a portfolio company again, because it doesn't scale. I can only do that once. Um, but I did learn when I was the CEO of the first two businesses uh, and did those tours of duty that when the CRM got involved, that meant there was a lot more process happening than generally I would like to be part of. And that's just how I'm yeah. wired. Like, I don't, I don't want to be living that lifestyle. <laughs> kind of what I talked about. Before. Yeah. No, I, I just thought that was a fantastic, uh, I, I think I've on heard the you, road, you know, and very succinct. I think I've heard you talk about this before, Michael, but, um, from your perspective with the CEOs that you coach manage, uh, being a CEO in the past yourself, um, how impressed are you with like Elon Musk, for example? Like, what, does it make any sense or is there, am I not seeing it right? Um, look, I think dude's, dude's a lot richer and <laughs> successful than I am. He's sending people to Mars. Like I'm open a coffee yeah. shop. <laughs> so, so I'm going to give him. No, but just like in, in terms of being CEO of like SpaceX, Tesla, uh, whatever this brand neuro link or whatever. Neuralink. Yeah. Well, the AI yeah. stuff too. Look, I, AI um. Stuff. I think they, I think anybody that's doing the CEO job for real, you're like really a CEO, you can CEO one company at a time. Cause uh, so you think other people are doing uh, a lot of this there's, stuff probably. He's, he is the CEO <laughs> by title in the background. If you go look at it, there's actually, go look at Tesla, go look at mm. SpaceX. Like there is a, there is a Tim Cook person behind every single one of those. So number one, uh, like Elon is a super genius. His definition of what a CEO He's a super genius by putting those other people in there and motivating them in the right way and kicking out the people who aren't going to be the right people. Uh, but his definition of what a CEO really is is much more what I would consider a chairman style role. Gotcha. I think that's truly he's doing what, what you're doing. I think that's truly what he's doing. Uh, he's it's impossible. You can't see you can't CEO four businesses at once. It's just not true. <laughs> like so, I think he has it by title, but in practice, he is much more a visionary gotcha. chairman than a real CEO of any of those businesses. There's somebody in there who's actually really doing all of it. And you can go look at it. Just go look at the org chart. Every single one of them has a president, COO, and you're like, yep, that person makes sure payroll happens. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. for sure going on. Yeah, no, that's great. Okay, so you've decided that you're ready to hire a CEO. And what is, what's the steps? Walk us through that. Yeah. So at a high level, you know, you've know, you decided you want to live that lifestyle. Um, and then the next thing that people try to do is a mistake is they try to go from zero to hundred miles an hour and mm -hmm. get out of the business like tomorrow. And the reality is to maximize the chance of success to hire a CEO to replace you, uh, you have to get the business ready to go. And depending upon what the situation of the business is at that time, that could be a three week process or that can be a three year process to get it to where it's profitable, systems are running well, you have a good leadership team in place, it's ready for you to hire a CEO. And so that foundation has to get built. And for most people and the times I've done it, it usually takes a six to nine month process um, to go start to lay that foundation. And that foundation is not only about getting the business ready, but it's also about getting your team ready. And I encourage people at that point to start to have a discussion around what your dreams are as an owner and to be realistic with them that you're going to say, hey, my goal in the the near future is to transition and bring in a new CEO. I'm not the best person to CEO this, primarily because it's not my dream for myself to, to be in here running the business every day. And I'm going to get somebody in here who's better than me. And then I'm going to support them and help them be great. And you tell that to your team and start to get them emotionally ready for the new leader to come in. And only then, once the business and the team are ready, then you start to run a process to really, truly hire a CEO. And that's really step three. And for me, it can be something where you hire internally and there's trade-offs there to elevate a candidate and to be the CEO to do that job. And then you can also go outside, which I like doing more um, because you can potentially bring in somebody who has a lot of perspective that isn't going to be making the mistakes you made when you were CEO because the new CEO <laughs> only knows the mistakes you were making, so we got to keep making them. So, but that's where you can go run a full process around that um, and just use the hiring process as we talk about and you bring somebody in. And there's those whole ball of wax of how you're supposed to do things differently in step four, you know, after the new CEO is in, but I'll pause there and you can go in any direction. No, no, that's good. Let's let, I want to hear step four. 
Yeah, step four is really where you, after you bring in the CEO, you have to let them do that CEO job. And the mistake that most people make in transitioning out of the CEO role is they still stay there and keep doing the CEO job, right? Like, and so I, in the transitions that I've made, I've actually packed up all my crap and moved out of our office as a symbol, not only to the team, but also to myself that I am no longer the CEO here. And Jim mm. down the hall, uh, who we hired or Jane is now the CEO and they have the, not only do they have the title, uh, they actually have the authority and responsibility to do the things that we want. And so that change in behavior by myself has to happen. I mean, and it requires discipline. You got to get out of the office. You got to stop being in there. You got to stop second guessing. You got to stop going to the meetings and you got to stop acting like whatever your new role is, which is typically board chairperson or board member or just owner who's supporting Jim or Jane in their job as a new CEO. That is an entirely different set of things that you're doing every day compared to what you did when you were running the business. For example, let's say a big problem happens in a business and your team and you're the CEO, your team comes to you and says, hey, we got a big existential problem uh, in the business. Your job as the CEO in that situation is to respond and lean into that problem. Hey, let's get in there and get our hands dirty, fix that problem. Your job when you're the owner or the CEO or the chairman when there's a big problem that's brought to your attention, you, you tell the CEO, man, that, that sounds awful. What do you need from me? Right. And it's a totally different thing where the CEO has to be allowed to keep CEOing. And that's what step four is all about. And the little things you do in terms of where you're, where you're officing, how you react to every individual situation, all that kind of stuff has to shift. And it's actually the step four is actually the hardest thing for everybody transitioning to bring in professional management to run their company is to change themselves. Cause well, mm -hmm. I mean, changing ourselves is really hard. <laughs> we're, st we're stubborn. Yeah. We're entrepreneurs for a reason. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, you're, you're mentioning it with CEO here, but I think this really goes, if you're a small business owner, it's basically almost any role that you hire for where it's a managing role, you've got to let them do their job. And I think a lot of people still kind of stick to that hub spoke style of them running everything. Um, and, that's not going to allow you to grow and eventually step out, right? So, yeah, no, really valuable inputs there. So, you had mentioned, uh, know that you know you got to decide that this is is this the life that you want. Let's describe a little bit what the life is of you know you, the Holdco uh, entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah. So it's exciting, you know, Lamborghinis, private jets. I <laughs> 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 It's a, yeah, we can see your Lamborghini <laughs> over your shoulder out yeah. the window there. Yeah. <laughs> I wish. I totally wish. Um, yeah, it's a, actually a big problem. If you want to get, like, there's this whole population on social media that, like, needs you to do, like, a Grant Cardone jet talk. And, like, I only got on a private jet for the first time last year because my friend invited me to go on his private jet. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't even pony up the money <laughs> for it. It's like, uh, it is what it is. So, yeah. Um, so day in the life, um, my day, and I consider this a good thing. My day in the life is actually really boring. And it's kind of the opposite of, of reality TV. Like one of the things I read from one of the reality TV producers, he, he's one of the Real Housewife guys, I think. Uh, one of the things they discovered early on in producing reality TV is that actual reality, functional reality is really boring. And <laughs> I've, ad I've adopted that. My life is super boring. Um, from a business standpoint, you know, I like consistency. I'm like a little baby. I like a routine. Uh, I run by my calendar. I have routine meetings and interactions um, on my calendar. Uh, I time slice my time based on four, you know, four investments of energy. Time slice number one is 25% time that I spend precisely coaching and interacting and supervising companies and CEOs. So there's a whole routine and a dance we do uh, that is the ca the cadence of meetings with me and the company. And that's interaction flow and that's you know data sharing, supervision, all that kind of stuff. So that's bucket number one. Bucket number two is uh, special projects. And that's things that are me going and doing things for companies or working on incubating new companies. So for example, a companies going through a refinancing. Okay. Like I could be part of that special project or we need to hire a new CEO. 
or we're going to work on a big acquisition. They will call me in and I will be supportive and part of those special projects uh, or putting a new deal together. So like that's one of the things I've been working on uh, this past fall that I'm going to announce soon, hopefully. Um, then you have bucket three, which is uh, reading and learning. And I consider all my social media stuff part of that. I have to study and get better at explaining things uh, to and learn them better to explain them on social media. All of those threads and all that kind of stuff, that's in that bucket. How do I get smarter and sharper in the sword? And then bucket number four is the last 25% that I added last year, which is I block out time and I don't plan on doing anything. I just want to think about how to make decisions better. And that's that realization that as I look back on my life, I've made five or six decisions that I made them the right way and they have turned into all of the upside and everything else was noise. And how do I create the headspace to make sure that when those big decisions come along, I make the right decision. And that's what that last bucket of mm -hmm. non-booked time is all about. Margin, margin with your time. I love it. Yeah. Um, excellent. Thank you for sharing that. So I want to talk about board of directors briefly, because that's something that you've touched on a lot. Um, and just kind of what is a board of directors for for most of these small businesses that probably don't even have uh, or even thought about having a board of directors, what's the value in it uh, and what's the purpose of it and how do you build it? Yeah, 100%. So a board of directors uh, is a legal construct. It's in most of the most of the ways uh, corporations get defined in the United States. So C-Corps, uh, S-Corps, LLCs, they all have some version of people who are responsible for the supervision and have a fiduciary duty to the company. And the fiduciary duty of the company is you do what's best for the shareholders and balancing that with all the other stakeholders that are involved, customers, employees, all that kind of stuff. So a board of directors, it's a legal construct. In practice, the easiest way to think about it is it's like, imagine your city council. You know, if you have a city council for your city, it's that for a corporation. It is, it is a... Uh, it is a, a board of people who vote on initiatives uh, and approve things, speaking for the shareholders to make sure that the company does what it's supposed to do. And the reason boards can be made up of part-timers, but also very like um, effective is the same reason a lot of city councils are very effective. Have you ever, this is, I'll get a, I'll go on a tangent here. Have you ever noticed how like legislatures, like Texas legislature, probably the Oklahoma legislature, Congress, <laughs> Total dysfunctional messes, but by and large, most cities like do a really pretty good job. Have you guys? Have you guys? Yeah, like absolutely. So the fundamental reason is, is because Congress's job, let's just take Congress, has a much more difficult job. Their purview of all this budgeting and all this stuff that they have to cover, like declaring war and stuff, like they have a lot of stuff there. So you you have this mess of spaghetti that's just like a really hard thing. So of course it's freaking dysfunctional. The reason cities tend to work incredibly well is because their scope of things that they're responsible for is very narrow. Like, hey guys, uh, the 12 of you, your job is to make sure we have police and the trash gets picked up. Can you guys do that? They're like, yeah, we got you. <laughs> You're like, no problem. So boards are kind of the same way that in my opinion, a board done really well narrows down to a very specific set of responsibilities of things that it's going to be in charge of, right? And so you know, fundamentally, uh, the board does a few things. One is hires and fires the CEO, right? Who's going to be the CEO? And then they let the CEO do their job. Uh, they approve big decisions. So there's big things that are material as defined in the way the corporation is set up. Like they have to approve certain things like uh, acquisitions, loans, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then they approve strategic plans and budgets, right? And uh, done right, a board generally just does those three things. And that's why boards can be really functional is because you just narrow down their thing kind of like we do with the city council and just say, I'm only going to do those things. Notice at no point did we say the board is going to run the company. They don't do that. The CEO does that and they have their job, which is much harder than being on a board. Matter of fact, if you've got a board member who tries to run the company, you got a serious problem. Yeah, you need to fire their company. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the CEO is kind of a real problem. Yeah. Okay, so, and how do you incentivize a board? Uh, the easiest way is if they're owners of the company. Um, so one of the rules of creating a board is you have it as small as possible, but no smaller. So there are often times where I will, I'm on boards of companies where there's a board of two uh, and one of us owns more than the other one. So that person, that's how we break ties. It can be very straightforward. You already own, you, know, you already own. The company and you're all aligned around the shareholders because you are the shareholders. That's 100% the shareholders. 
Um, then there are other models in which people um, will have investors on boards. Uh, that is that is one model. Those people are incentivized because they're getting paid if the company does well, so they're aligned with shareholders. Uh, and then there are people that will show up on boards as outside independents, right? Um, and that's very common, say, for example, uh, if you have a board that's, say, for example, five people and the company has raised money, management, and the, the founders, they're on the board, they might have two seats and they're highly in, in, you know motivated to make sure that that equity turns into something someday. The investors might have two seats um, and they're highly incentivized to make sure the investors make money. And then you'll bring in an independent and that may be somebody from industry or a neutral party that, you know, because you want to have an odd number of people so you don't have any ties. The fifth person can come in and they can get paid in multiple ways. The most common way is they get equity from an equity pool defined for the board members and they have a meaningful yeah. stake in it. Um, the best independent board members I've actually seen have come in and asked to invest in that company and put mm. their own money to work. And they often did that when they walked in the room and realized they were the only person that hadn't invested in the company, <laughs> either through sweat equity or money, and asked to put money into it. I've seen it happen multiple times, and those board members have been awesome. There are some schemes where people also get a stipend. Um, they get paid mm. to do that. Um, there's upsides and downsides to that. Um, Obviously, when you're getting a stipend of cash, that is much different than when you're an equity co-owner. So if you're right. all aligned in co-owners, that's the ideal as much as possible. Hmm. You know, two things jump real quickly to mind thinking about our audience and, and my experience. One is there's a certain amount of liability to being on a board. Uh, people need to know about that when they do it. And at what level of company do you think it's practical to bring in a board? I mean, I guess it's situational on your company, but. Yeah. Hey, you know, 5 million, 10 million, 50 million, you know, it's, it's asking people to do a lot. Yeah. Look, I think most companies uh, shouldn't have a board. Um, I think most people who say are a small contractor, let's say you're, you know, 10 million a year contractor or 20 million a year contractor. Uh, my buddy owns a $25 million a year uh, specialty contractor here. They do not have a board. Uh, he substitutes a lot of what people get out of boards by joining a CEO peer group. Um, mm -hmm. I'm part of, I'm part of one. We actually, at one of the 12 businesses is actually a CEO peer group. We launched one last year called scale path, um, for smaller businesses. And, you know, I think that's where you can substitute that. My advice to people is don't have a board until you really feel like you absolutely must have one. And, mm -hmm. you know, you must have one at some point when you take outside investors, you must have one sometimes from a regulatory perspective. I've been in businesses that the, the regulators required them, um, or you're going to be getting out of the CEO role. Um, those are all times mm -hmm. when you really must do it. And I just encourage people like, don't do it till you have to. But that stuff you get from a board, which is like advisory, opinions, experience, like all that kind of stuff. See if you can find another way to do it. And one way is a CEO peer group. Um, I actually do it for a couple of companies. Like people pay me to be like board members at large for them. They pay me a retainer. And like we talk a couple hours a month. I'm not a CEO coach, but I'm like a board member that like, like when they have a problem, we talk about their problems um, and I act like a board member, but I don't vote and I don't have a fiduciary duty or anything. So there's ways to do that. But I would just say don't do a formal board until you absolutely have to. And for some people, they never have to. Like there's $100 yeah. million dollar companies with no board. Like don't waste time with formality right. unless you really feel like you have to do it. Find that stuff the other way if you can, because boards are a lot of work. <laughs> you, think, yeah. you don't want to be managing a board. It's like, it's, I do it all the time. It's a pain in the butt. <laughs> Hey there, cash flow contractors, just a second before we dive back into our conversation. If you're a contractor juggling leads, customers, deals, and projects, I've got something that will change how you operate, our CRM growth kit. Imagine having all of your stuff in one place, easy to find, easy to manage, easy to track. One source of truth for you and your team to find leads, help customers, close deals, and manage projects. We've helped dozens of contractors with our CRM growth kit for managing their workflows. If you feel like there are improvements that you can make in tracking things in your business, it's worth jumping on a call. Click the link in the show notes to schedule a free 30 minute call with me and learn how we can help improve your customer and project workflows. Thank you so much for tuning in back to the show. So, um, I want to talk about acquisitions. Um, and this probably, you know, goes even maybe even before you hire a CEO sometimes, but talking about acquiring other companies in construction you've looked at you've evaluated several construction companies in the past uh what are some things that you look for in acquiring company when is it right 
give us the rundown? Yeah, it's really good question. Um, yeah. So any, anybody new to me, I have a podcast called Acquisitions Anonymous. We started it in yeah. late 2020. We've done 270 episodes. The shtick of the podcast is really fun. We, there's four of us, we show up totally unprepared. We pull up a business that is for sale and we riff on that business for about a half hour. We click record and we publish it. It's turns out to be a really simple concept. It's like super good radio and really fun. Yeah. And, um, so we've done a number of businesses. Uh, construction is definitely one of the ones that has shown up here and there. And one of the co-hosts actually owns a roofing contractor uh, in okay. Columbia, South Carolina. So he bought that business and he, uh, his name is Mill Snell, great follow on Twitter. Um, but basically he went through uh, a process where he was originally a business broker. He ended up working for a private equity firm called uh, Permanent Equity located in, in Missouri. Brent Bashore's firm. And he got to know this industry of construction really well. And he felt like there were opportunities there for him to buy a business. Uh, he spent a year doing a search and finally found a business in Columbia, South Carolina and moved there to do that. And I think that really, as you're starting to look at doing acquisitions, um, a couple of things that he did, I think are really good lessons for other people looking to do acquisitions. Um, number one, when he did it, he got like really good help. He hired like a, a an M and A lawyer that knew their stuff. He went in and did a quality of earnings report. Like these were all people that on the buy side, um, really helped shepherd him through making sure he made a good deal. The banking partners as well. Like he treated them all as not just uh, vendors to him, but partners in helping him make sure the whole thing worked out well. So number one, that's assembling the right team to do it is really good. Number two, he went and bought an industry that he understood really well. Uh, you know, if you are a contractor who is uh, a, a small, you know, a small you know, backyard playscape contractor, I would uh, be really wary about trying to leverage that knowledge into like, OK, well, you know what I'm going to do now? I'm going to do uh, I'm going to do lights and signals for the local city. It's a totally different thing. Um, so I think that's where it's really important to just narrow down where your expertise and where your unfair advantage is going to be. And that's really point number three. Like we as strategic buyers, whether we're, in my case, like I'm a software guy and I'm a media guy now or whatever, uh, if you're a contractor and you're going to go buy somebody else, like leverage your unfair advantages to go find something that's really going to be one plus one equals three for you. Um, and for example, one of my companies, um, I'm helping them go through a strategic acquisition of another competitor that's about 50% the size. Uh, nobody else would be able to value the business like we are because we have this platform that we're going to bolt them onto. So, you know, that's where I encourage people, like, it's very tempting to go, like, try to bridge beyond where you are and where your expertise is and your unfair advantage is, uh, but fight that urge and just parlay your, your search to bolt onto your business uh, to something that's really going to be beneficial and take advantage of where you're strong. Yeah. I think on Twitter, you've probably seen it, but especially whenever um, SBA loans were very lucrative for people. Uh, there were a lot of uh, more finance people. And we actually spoke to one. I can't, what was his name? Um, I'm forgetting. Edwards, maybe oh. in uh, in Steamboat. Anyways. Uh, oh, yeah. Some, fi the some finance guy. guys talking about um, just purchasing more of the trades businesses and getting becoming operators and just acquiring them to grow them and get a nice multiple going and then sell. And they make it sound so easy, but it's so challenging. Um, yeah. What, what are the challenges that usually arise with an acquisition when you do actually take place? Yeah. It's one of, it's another one of my social media problems. Like, like the internet wants you to tell people stuff is easy and so on and dream and all this kind of stuff. But I'm over here like, uh, but actually let me tell you how this sucks, right? Like it's really hard. All this is very difficult. Um, look, I think when you start to deal with a services business, especially our contracting business, like you go talk to every single one of these people who runs one of these businesses and you ask them what their biggest headache is. It's like hiring and retention of great people. And like all of that is the constant struggle here. And I think a lot of these people think they can come in and really spreadsheet their way to fixing human problems, right? One of the, one of the, one of the problems with human nature is we'll take people problems and we'll try to throw a system at it, or we'll take a system problem. We'll try to throw people at it. And it's just like, it's easy to just get really screwed up there. So, you know, I think as I see people for whom they're in Boston and they're like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to move to Arkansas and like, uh, 
and like take over this HVAC company or whatever. It's like, well, or this contracting company, it's like, slow your roll there, boss. Like, uh, yeah. it can be done, but it's something where, you know, fundamentally going into it, understanding what the core challenge of your business is, is the first step. And, you know, when I've seen people succeed with this, it's because they know what the pain in the ass, grass isn't greener aspect of the business is, and they go in mentally prepared to try to thrive in that. And, and I think that can really work. Uh, my co-host on Acquisitions Anonymous, Bill D'Alessandro, talks about one of his investment banking colleagues. He's a former investment banker turned e-com guy. Um, one of his investment banking colleagues went and got involved in the restaurant business in Arkansas and has since totally killed it. But this was like a, a Wall Street, New York guy. And uh, he tells the story about when the guy bought his first franchise, uh, the franchise or made you work in the franchise for the first six months. So he would like call down there and be like, hey, what's up, dude? And he's like, I'm busy. I'm taking orders on the phone. Like it was like a, it's like a domino. <laughs> but it was, he did that and that succeeded because he had the right mindset going into it. And I think mm -hmm. just as a searcher who's trying to buy a business or whatever, like just be, be open. It can totally work. Just be open-eyed about, it's not all rainbows and unicorns you know, when you get on the other side and people are not spreadsheets. Like that's the other, the other yeah. thing. You know, I, I, I'm going to steal that. You can't spread your sheet your way to resolving people problems. That's fantastic. Yeah. I've always said two things about acquisitions is from the buyer's side. And I've got four or five companies in this state right now. I call it a culture issue. Yeah. I mean, that we've you've refined what I mean by culture a little bit, but those people, when they merge airlines, they argue over whose check uh, checklists get used, United or Continental. Right. It, it's culture, and the second side of this is, I'm we have a lot of people who are maybe not looking to acquire, as you postulated there, Khalil. Yeah, but we have guys listening about what it might take in order to have something attractive to sell. And I think that's one of the big advantages of what you just said. You kind of listed it out. My understanding is 80, 80, 85 percent of the businesses that go to market, make a real attempt to go to market to be sold, do not sell. Yep. Is it, is that accurate in your mind? Yeah, that's that's for numerous reasons. One one of which is some guy at the country club told me I should sell it for X, and my offers all came in at X minus X divided by five. <laughs> but that <laughs> happens a lot. I yeah. uh, can't blame him. Can't blame him. Um, yeah, but yeah, I I think that's where a lot of people don't think ahead in terms of being ready to sell the business. So one of my friends, she's sixty five. She runs a business, and we were talking yesterday. Um, she's like, look, I'm on a three year time clock here. Like I want to be out of here and I'm starting my plan now in terms of how I'm going to transform the business. And, you know, one of the ways to do that and figure out what you need to do is to go start having discussions now with folks that know what will make your business more attractive to sell later on. And, you know, the, the business broker investment banker landscape has gotten to where they are so desperate for deals. They will sit down <laughs> with you when you say I'm going to sell in two years and tell you the things that they think buyers will be looking for and the changes you should go ahead and make. Um, and some will even go as so far, there's a couple of couple of business brokers and bankers I've seen do this. They will give you a checklist, which is like one of them, uh, if you Google it, it's called transferable value assessment. How much of this business can be transferred to the next buyer? And you go through the checklist and it's like, it'll ask you fundamental questions. Like if I leave for a week as the CEO, do can the business keep functioning? Like that is the, like that, that will add turns of EBITDA to your business. So getting out now, two, three, five years before you think about exiting and talking to potential buyers and brokers is really a great way to go about that. Oh, if you have a, I've got a, like a 400 question questionnaire, which is a little big, but it's not from me. It's one that I got from a guy, but it's exactly that. You got to do this, do this, do this. And, uh, Anyway, it's a it's a process. I'd like to ask you one thing too, without getting too far off. The idea of the CEO, okay, which we've talked about. I'm going to narrow them down a little bit. They're the keeper of the vision and the keeper of the culture. You know, that's primarily this is who we are. This is what we're doing. Let's go, guys. In theory, I talk with lots of companies about how we're going to replace the management. You know, if you're not here, how's the company going to run? It's that person is always really, really hard, or that's been my experience. 
uh, how about you? I mean, it's finding that real person who is a real leader, not a number two, a real leader who has, who can manage, manage, lead the culture and the vision and where we're going. Your thoughts on that? Yeah. I, there's a reason why CEOs get paid well. Number one, it's a hard job. Number two, it's hard to find people to do that role. So I, I 100% agree with you. Um, you know, I think the other side of it, which I've seen in practice is CEO is a learned set of skills for people um, with provided they have the basic natural talents, right? And so, you know, there are lots of opportunities and I've been shocked to see how many people don't want to be an entrepreneur, but want to be a CEO of a small business. And I've had a ton of luck uh, going out and just being straightforward about the type of job it is, writing a CEO job description um, for a 10 or 20 or $30 million a year company. Like there are tons of people that want those jobs. Um, the tough part is because there's so few of those jobs, rarely do you see people who come in who have done it and you want to hire them. There's a bunch of, bunch of them who've done it and they suck and you don't want to hire them. So almost <laughs> everybody end up hiring that turns out great in that role has had some level of general management and kind of experience in their career. They're closer to mid-career. So they've got all those fundamental skills, but nobody's really given them an opportunity to be a CEO at this point. And I've been really shocked at how many people there are that want those jobs, but they don't want to be entrepreneurs. There's just, there's thousands of probably even more than that, tens of thousands of them out there looking for those gigs. And every time I post one, I just get tons of applicants for it um, and they're shockingly good. So I would encourage people to at least test that and understand there are people out there. They just don't necessarily come in with a resume where they're like, yep, I've been a CEO for 10 years and I'm ready to take on your job. Most of the time they come in and you have to kind of put the pieces together and squint your eyes a little bit and be like, okay, this person has a really good chance of being great. Mm. Very good. Very good. So uh, last thing I wanted to talk about before we go into some little one-offs is you've hired CEOs. Now you're building the whole co. What is the, tell us more about the holding company. We've talked about the lifestyle of that um, chairman, but what does the holding company look like in practice? You've got an entire course on this. Maybe just give us the cliff notes version of that. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I, uh, the holding company for me is this parallel entrepreneurship where I have multiple companies that are growing, ideally not shrinking or staying the same size. And I have significant say in an ideally majority ownership of all those things. Uh, and then I have the right people running those businesses and they're living their best life and I'm living my best life and we all win. That's that's the ideal from a Holdco perspective. There are different flavors of what Holdcos look like. There is, you know, my Holdco, which is an assortment of random crap this is the best way to describe it. All great businesses, but it's ran it's a random mixture of stuff. It looks more like a mini Berkshire Hathaway. Then you have people like my buddy Reg Zeller, who's big on Twitter, uh, who is doing specifically a hold co around a specific type of foundry, right? And they've been entirely successful around that and uh and are killing it. So and then there's all kinds of versions in between that people have assembled things um, with different intentions. So I think that's one of the cool things about hold coing in practice is you really get to create this beast that serves the type of life that you want to live. Um, you know, in practice, I spend my days the the way we talked about. Uh, and in terms of growing, the last few years have been much more about uh, incubation and creating things. Mm -hmm. And that's for two reasons. Um, you know, and I say incubation as opposed to buying companies. Uh, number one, uh, I have much more fun with incubation. And number two, the prices for stuff for sale has been ridiculously high. So I I look over here and I'm like, okay, I can buy this thing at 10 times earnings or I could make an asset and have a lot of fun doing it. Like I'll just make the asset. And so a lot of the growth of the hold co for the past few years has been entirely incubated. And that's just because those two reasons. Hmm. That's very good. So you have a thread on Twitter as the first one I saw from you a while back. Um, I think it's, it's 60 something, 65 things you should never do in life or something like that. I forget the name of it. We'll link to it in the show notes, but I'm going to go through several of these and just, I want to hear context from you. So uh, first one, never believe a software consultant when they say it's 90% done. Yeah. Explain. Um, look, the uh, it, it, there's a fundamental misunderstanding by most people who create software as to how the value actually gets created. And you'll end up with uh, a 90% implementation of a CRM or whatever, and it'll stay at 90% 90, 90 for like years. And you're like, why is this still 90%? It's because they have so many ways they can go wrong. 
And, uh, and especially if you, a friend comes to you and says, Hey, I need 10 grand to finish building this app. It's 90% done. That that's never the case. <laughs> that means, that means you're maybe close to half. Um, and it's just the nature of how software and those types of things work. They, the, they either function entirely or they're broken and you got to find that out. And the mere process of fixing things in software just requires so much more work than software consultants will tell you. And, uh, yeah, so I can't believe those guys. They're nice though. Yeah. I also, I also talk about, uh, just they, they get so good at marketing to, um, you know, the, the pain points and the value adds and all these things as a software company that whenever you are a contractor, you think you're going to buy the software, it's going to solve all your problems. Oh yeah. I just pay this monthly retainer for it and uh, it's done. But I think it's behavior change inside your company to actually use the software, yeah. uh, to make it work for you. Uh, one of my companies is on year four of an ERP implementation. <laughs> it's going great. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. But it's adding some value at some point, right? But it's still we have something to chaos. talk about. <laughs> yeah, keep keeping some IT guys and programmers interested. Amen. To yeah, that. keeping people employed. Okay, so uh, next one: never do deals that you know will be disastrous for the other side. What do you mean? Uh, yeah. So if you do a deal that you know won't work out for the other side, uh, that just means they haven't figured out it won't work out for them yet. And um, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's where especially if you're expecting to maintain a relationship with them or work with them in the future or that relationship to continue, you're just like lighting the fuse on a time bomb. So, uh, you know, there's one thing where somebody comes in and like overpays for a property that you have and then you walk away, but you know, that's a sale. If you're going to do a deal in a partnership with somebody and, and expect it to be a win-win long-term, but you know, it's not going to be a win-win for them. Um, just play the long game and don't screw yeah. people over. Mm -hmm. I have a, a friend, um, his family owns several businesses and partners with people and they do chocolate bar deals. Um, I'm not sure if people know what this is or maybe if, if that's the right term for it, but basically um, they've partnered with someone in a business and now the partner wants to buy them out and uh, basically say, okay, well, say the price and whatever the price is it, yeah. that you say, I can buy it for that much too. Um, and so I think that's a good kind of- buy it or sell it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, okay. So next one, never own software systems without having login passwords. Oh yeah. <laughs> I feel like I, this one has some experience behind it. Yeah. I mean, you'll, you'll look up and, um, uh, you know, some employee will leave and you're like, so how do we get into it? Well, Jim left and he's decided not to let <laughs> us in anymore unless we pay him $10,000. Uh, I've seen, um, software consultants, SEO guys. I've seen them all do that kind of stuff. Um, and actually a friend of mine was held hostage by a consultant where the guy was like, mm -hmm. no, I need $50,000 if you want your software access. And uh, he ended up having to sue the guy, which is a total mess, but it wouldn't have, wouldn't have been a problem if he had administrator rights to the whole thing. So you want to have the passwords and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I see this with uh, Google, my business accounts, which are so vital to service companies. Yep. Oh my gosh. The, they've got the office admin with ownership access and no one else knows how to get to it. Oh man, it's, it's a Brutal. nightmare. Okay. Uh, never assume lots of education makes you wise. Yeah. Yeah. There's a difference between, uh, having a degree and being smart. Uh, case in point. Mm -hmm. There's a, uh, a, a saying around the oil fields in Oklahoma that that feller's educated beyond his intelligence. Oh, that's great. <laughs> kind of captures that. Anyway, I love that. That's good. Okay. Uh, never underestimate the power of an enemy, real or imagined, to motivate a company. Yeah. I think this is a great one. Uh, most people misread this. And basically what I'm saying is, is your enemy is something that everybody wants to see changed in the world. And your enemy can be a person, <laughs> which I don't <laughs> recommend. But more likely and more appealing is you make the enemy of your company a change you want to see in the world. For example, your enemy can be that... Uh, that it is incredibly a pain in the ass to deal with contractors, or it can be your enemy is cost overruns. Like, and you can make that your reason to come together as a company. Uh, and you ideally want to have an enemy that something is going to be better in the world by working with you for your customers, people, and employees. So uh, the en this enemy concept is super powerful and every company should try to think about how to have one of these, in my opinion. Mm. I think that's Very good. great. Yeah. 
get a lot gets a lot of motivation going too for the team. Okay, so never believe what consumers tell you they will buy or will do. Yeah, so this is uh, this is straight out of the psychology textbooks. Um, <laughs> most people are delusional about what they're actually going to do. Uh, revealed preference is the idea that shows up in the psychology textbooks. I didn't make it up, yeah. but it's totally true. Yeah, yeah. Malcolm Gladwell talks about that in Spaghetti Sauce. I think is was his. Yeah. Everybody wanted like hearty and chunky, but that's not really what they bought. They just yeah. the normal one. Yeah. Okay. Um, the CEO is always the last to know. Oh yeah, yeah. This is this is a practical thing. Uh, if you know, if you're like go to one of your employees, you're like, hey, I think Jim's been stealing. Uh, they'll be like, you didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> oh hey, you know, Deborah's having a tough time with her marriage. You know, it's really affecting her work. They're like, you didn't know. <laughs> like it took you long enough. <laughs> so that's just you. Sh people and I talk to CEOs, and they're always like, I'm so worried about like. Sowing dissent or like educating people on this stuff. They, I'm like, they already, know. they know your business is screwed yeah, up. They know everything. Yeah. Like yeah. they know better. They did before you do. Yeah. I, I love that one. Okay. I got two more. Being in a good market plus business matters more than how hard you work. Oh, I, yeah. I'd rather, I'd rather be in a great business with a mediocre team than a uh, mediocre business with a great team. The market wins every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that you got to understand the game you're playing. Um, 100%. And too many people don't. Okay, uh, last one. You, if you can't leave for a month and things go well, you don't have a business. We talk about that a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. You're. We talked a little earlier about this idea of the genius with a thousand helpers or genius with 12 helpers. A lot of businesses run that way. And if you want to sell your business someday, uh, you need to figure out how to not run your business <laughs> run your business yeah. as a real business and not as a uh, 12 glorified assistants, which I see happen a lot. Yeah. Very good, man. Michael, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for being on. We're going to link to everything in yeah, the show notes, everything from scale path, you which you mentioned, time. everything uh, near for hiring in Latin America, um, your Twitter account and the threads that we've mentioned, uh, the hold co course. Um, what am I leaving out? Anything? The, uh, uh, Acquirers Anonymous. Oh, That's Acquisitions Anonymous. Yeah. Yeah. Acquisitions Anonymous. Yeah. For all you addicts be listening there. to that today. Yeah. You yeah. guys are great. Fun. Okay. Thanks for talking. Absolutely. Absolutely. See ya. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Cashflow Contractor. Check out our website in the show notes or visit thecashflowcontractor.com.